I hold in my hand here a toy known as a transformer. Now, at first glance, it looks a lot like an everyday truck, but as the TV commercial will be happy to tell you, transformers more than meets the eye. So watch as I transform this toy into an Autobot robot ready to save the world from the Decepticons. Now, I know some of you are thinking, wait, I, I've seen your Facebook, I've seen the calendar. Aren't you turning 43 next week? Yeah, I am. But I'm enjoying my second childhood even more than my first one. All right, so there we go. That is not bad, just a few seconds there. Now, some of you are saying, oh, Scott, you know, come back to reality, at least for a moment here. Maybe you did kind of lose it over there on the turnpike. But one of the best things, I believe, actually, about being a parent, getting older, you know, having kids, all the rest of that, is getting to play with your kids' toys. You know, at, at, at Christmas, I always say, give me that kid. I just got to make sure it works right. You know, let, let me get the batteries and everything. And they're always going, ah, come on, let me play with it, you know, and all that. But I brought this here tonight not to play with it, but hopefully that we would have here an understanding. See, this little transforming truck here, this is what I'm hoping you'll remember, is a huge transforming truth. What is it? Well, again, if you're taking some notes, if you're thinking things through with me here tonight, it's that the Christian life is not just about information. It's about transformation. It's not just information, it's transformation. And spiritually speaking, we are each called to be transformers when you think about that. What does that mean? Well, we are to be those in the process of change, those who are being transformed, those who are being renewed. See, God wants to change us, to transform us. He wants us to be radically different than we used to be. Than we used to be? Yeah, than we used to be before we knew him, and hopefully very different than the world around us. And so what you see here as we take a look at Romans chapter 12, I just want to look quickly at verse 2 with you. We'll go back and look at several verses here, but first of all, we're just going to jump to verse 2 because it's really the main idea here. It says, And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, as you see here, this passage really presents two very, very clear choices, which is choice number one, conformed to the world, conformed to the world. And then choice number two, transformed by the word. Those are the things that are going on, hopefully, in our lives right there. That we were once conformed to the world, but now transformed by the word. And so at any given moment, you can say in your life, you're either being conformed or you're being transformed. And so a great question to consider here tonight, which one is it? See, the world works very hard to conform us. Now, when I was a teenager, you know, I at least tried to be a nonconformist, whatever that was. But we all, basically, I look back at pictures and realize we were pretty conformed to the nonconforming standard, whatever that might be. But they had kind of this every year list that would come out that would say what's in and what's out. I don't know if you guys ever saw that, but the teen magazines would all say, oh, this is in, this is out. Now, I don't know who they are, but they would decide this, you know. And they would then be happy to sell us the stuff that was in so that we would get rid of the stuff that was out. But I really feel kind of sorry for kids these days because it's not really a yearly list. It's almost like a weekly or daily list sometimes that by the time they get to the store and get it out to the parking lot and put it in the car, it's already, oh, man, that is so last week. That is so incredibly 2000 and late. You know, you got to forget that. And so the world works really hard to get us to conform to that outward standard there. But the bigger issue, of course, is not hairstyles or clothing or all the rest of that. It's the inward conformity. See, it's really the fact that the world puts a lot of pressure on us, peer pressure, to live with the same selfishness, with the same sinful patterns, with the same priorities, with the same sinful attitudes as unbelievers do. And so... If you're familiar with this verse, you can just jot it down. It gives a nice little outline of what the world is all about when it's talking about the pattern of the world. See, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says this, All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 
that's not of the Father, but it's of the world. So it's talking there about the lust, the lust, and the pride, you know, the different things. And so God says, don't be conformed to those things. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the word. And so you might ask how, and that's a good question to ask. And the Bible right there gives the answer. It says in verse 2, by the renewing of our minds. By the renewing of our minds. See, it's the word of God that actually renews, renovates our mind, and transforms our lives from the inside out. See, the transformation that God wants to do in our life, it's not an outward conformity. You know, it's not him wanting to do some outward transformation, you know, and say, okay, we'll get him a shower and a haircut and everything's cool. No, the Bible says, in fact, it's inward that God wants to do the work. Sometimes people say, you know, Christians are brainwashed. Have you ever heard that? I don't go to that Calvary Chapel place, man. They'll brainwash you with the Bible there. But you know what I say to that? Most minds in here could probably use a good washing. <laughs> See, you think about it this way. What goes on in our minds will determine to a large extent what goes on in our lives. Because what we're believing is how we will be behaving. And so as you see that, those things going on, I know our minds control us. See, even kids understand this. When she was just five years old, I asked our daughter Carissa to go upstairs at night one time and just said, hey, could you get something out of your room? You know, just go run upstairs and go get it. You know, I'm the old man. I don't want to go run and get it. You go get it. And so she said, I can't, Daddy. I'm scared to go upstairs alone, you know. And I said, oh, come on, sweetie. You've been up there. You know there's nothing there. I have cleaned the closets of all the monsters and everything else. There's nothing to scare you up there. But she looked at me with those little puppy dog eyes, and she said, I know, Daddy, but my mind controls me. And so, just in a simple sense, a five-year-old knows my mind, what goes on in my mind is what will come out of my life. And so until our minds change, well, certainly our lives will never change. Our lives will never be transformed as long as our mind is conformed. And so what really needs to happen again is that we would be renewed in our thinking. New attitudes, new appetites, new actions, new abilities even. Now, again, you might say, I think my mind's okay. You know, I know it's got some maybe brain cells missing for different things, but I only use 10% of it anyway. So why does my mind need to be transformed here? Well, I would say because all of our minds have been deformed. Deformed by sin, conformed to the worldly ways. And you might ask, how does it happen? You know, how... how Quickly, like, can I just have my mind renewed right like that? Well, certainly God will, in a point in time, renew our mind even through just an understanding of who he is and what he's done. But this is the thing. It really is a process. See, God saves our soul in a moment of time, and that's a great thing. But we talk about it often here. The renewing of our minds, the changing of our lives, does take some time as well. It's a lifelong process, really. And so even as it was with this toy that I brought here today, just to think on it with you, it took some time to bring about that transformation. The truck didn't just transform itself. Now, if you're the kind of person who believes what you see on TV, you would think it would, right? Because I've seen the commercials for this, and the little graphics guys go, you know, and it's all done. And then there's that really quick voice that says things in, in so fast that you can't understand and so low you don't know what they're saying. And there's that little disclaimer that says, some assembly required, or whatever. And that's every parent's worst nightmare is some assembly required. But I can tell you, when it comes to the Christian life, there's some assembly required. The great news is you have the hand of God doing the work. See, all you have to do really is do what this toy did, which is surrender to him, and the hand of the Lord can certainly do those changes in our lives. And so as a person, you're either being con formed to the world or transformed by the word. And so the Apostle Paul here tonight is going to help us figure out how that transformation is progressing, how that progress is going. And so let's look together at verse 1 of Romans 12, just backing up there. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, that word that he starts with there in verse 1, it's therefore, and I always ask, 
what is it there for? Well, we know from these studies that it's pointing back to what came before. Now, if you've ever read through Romans, well, I'd encourage you to do that, but I'll summarize it for you here. The first 11 chapters, wow, what it basically is is one message, one main message, those 11 chapters, and right here it changes over to the application of that understanding. But the first 11 chapters, it just talks about the mercies of God, the mercies of God, the mercies of God, the grace of God, the gospel, that Jesus loves us though we were separated by sin and that he wants us to live forever with him and he has built the bridge for us on that. So that is the point of the first 11 chapters. But then at that point, Paul says, now, Guess what? You know, you know all that. Now what? You have all that information, 11 chapters of information, but now what? So what? Well, it's great to get the right information, but it's more important now to have the radical transformation. And again, I wonder how many people just stop at the information. Man, I got all the information. Well, that's good. That's a starting point. But the radical transformation, that's really why God gave the information to start with. See, the mercy, that's a great motive. I just want to start thinking about that with you. Sometimes you think about the different motives that people have for change. People can change because of fear. People can change because of greed or you know, guilt or peer pressure and all those types of things. Manipulation. You can get somebody convinced to change for a short time. But see, if we're being tra- changed because... God's mercy, because we understand and embrace God's mercy, well, the mercy motive is one that will continue throughout a lifetime. See, again, you can guilt someone into change for a short time, but when the guilt is gone, when you're not there to put on the pressure, eh, they're going to go away from that. God's mercies, I love it. The Bible says they're new every morning. That is something that day by day, I'm receiving that, and because of that, in reaction to it, he's changing my life. Now, you see in verse 1, he says, I beseech you. That's The word beg. What he's saying there as an apostle is, I ain't too proud to beg. He's saying, I'm pleading with you. You know, it's not the command. It's not the demand. It's not the forcing of things. It's saying, hey, because I love you, I'm begging you for this. You know, there's changes you can't force. I mean, I can force a temporary change. But, you know, the thing that sometimes you do as a parent is you're reduced down to begging in a way because you realize, hey, I can't force somebody to do something oh yeah, I could get out the spanking spoon and I could do that. But you know, there's a point where you say, you know, I think those days are pretty much behind us. You know, (laughs) get it behind us, Um, spanking spoon. All right, now, the law says command. It says demand. You got to stay with it. These are the jokes, folks. Now, (laughs) mercy, here's the thing. Mercy, when you think about what mercy does in our life, when I see all that God has done for me, It just awakens something in me. It makes me want to do something for him. It makes me want to be pleasing to him. And so it says there to give your body over as a living sacrifice. Now, what does God want with my body? It's not, you know, am I donating it to science or what? No, it's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is everything that you are. Your heart, your mind, your soul, everything that you are, top to bottom, toe to head, all the rest of that. In the Old Testament, you know that they had dead sacrifices, right? They were always killing animals and putting them on the altar there as a, as a dead sacrifice for their different sins. But you know what? In the New Testament, you see something so different. Here it's calling for a living sacrifice, for us to be a living sacrifice on that altar. Now, if you think about it, that presents a, b- a bit of a problem. What is it? Well, the problem with a living sacrifice is it would have a tendency to keep crawling off the altar. See, and that's exactly what happens in my life, I know, is God begins to turn up the heat to alter me on that altar, and I'm like a living sacrifice there, and I'm like, I'm cool as long as it's on low simmer, but I really don't like the high heat setting, you know, where God's bringing about some big changes maybe, and it's like, shh, ah, get me out of here. You know, but it's at that altar that we get altered, and so as a living sacrifice, God says, hey, Scott, quit crawling. Make the choice to be transformed by the word, you know, even when the heat gets high, because the alternative is to be conformed to the world. And you think about that, it is a matter of trust, a matter of surrender. Why should I do that, you might say? You know, it it sounds like that's what God wants to do, put me on an altar and bake me, you know, fry me like a burger. No. 
See, this is the thing, again, in light of God's mercies. He's saying it's your reasonable sacrifice. What he's trying to get rid of is the stuff that is not good for you anyway. He's, you know, kind of cooking out those impurities, if you could put it that way. You know, I got bacteria in me spiritually, and it's like, okay, he's going to put me on that grill. Now, rational, logical, those are the words here. It's saying it just makes sense. See, if Jesus was willing to give his life for me, then it only makes sense to me to certainly live my life for him. I mean, if, if he cared about me enough to lay down his life for me, I think he knows what's best for me. And it reminds me of an episode of Gilligan's Island, part of, uh, you know, having a renewed mind. I guess some stuff still stuck up in there. I, I watched a lot of sitcoms, and I got at least part of my philosophy of life from Gilligan's Island. But <laughs> Gilligan, you know, he, he risked his life at one point. I don't know if you remember this episode, but he risked his r life once for a native, you know, that was there on the island. And this guy then became his indentured servant, you know, and, and he was just as messed up as Gilligan. And so the whole thing just became this big disaster, you know, as this guy was saying, I owe you my life. Life. I must follow you around and do everything. And I think about it that way. When I am a servant of the Lord, I'm not sure he's getting a great deal. I mean, really. But that's what I say. I say, here, you got me. You know, and I'm sure he's going, oh, okay, well, this will take a little longer. But that's all right with your help. But it makes sense. Why? Because he's saying, hey, I wouldn't even have a life if not for you. So why would I not want to give my life? in service to you. So God saved my soul. He gave me eternal life. Certainly I can trust him with the life I have now, the few years I get here. It just makes sense. That's what he's saying. Is it for God's benefit? You know, God needed servants. Oh man, God has such great needs. No, we have great needs and he knows the greatest meeting of those needs will be in us serving him. See, he can only bless the part of the life that I give over to him. If I give him 5% of my life, well, I'm living in 5% of God's best for me. But when I give over my whole life to him, hey, he can bless the whole 100%. And I need it. And so that brings us to verse 2 again. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, the word transform, just so you know, you know, many of us think, oh, I know what it means, you know. But the underlying word there in the Greek, it's really cool, is metamorphosis. That's the underlying word, and that's the word that we use uh, for the change for a, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. You know, an internal change that's so significant that if you were to hold those two things up in front of a kid and say, do you think this can become this? They would say, <laughs> what do you think, I am stupid? And they go, well, no. But that's internal change, right? It's something that is a great change of nature and even character. And note the choices here. It says you're either going to be conformed, you're going to stay a caterpillar, or transformed. And the world, again, wants to conform you. The Lord wants to transform you. And it's a question of getting your heart and life and mind into his hand. The world controls your thinking if it does. If the things that really determine your behavior, like what your friends are thinking and all that sort of thing, if that's really what controls you, well, I hate to tell you, but you're being conformed. No, I'm not. I'm a nonconformist. All my friends are nonconformists. Okay. But if God controls you, hey, then you're a transformer. That's what we're talking about here tonight. Not only being transformed, but you're the kind of person that God could use to change the world because it needs it. And see... The more modern translations, some of them put things in interesting ways. I like the way this verse here is uh, translated in the Phillips translation, if you've ever heard that one. But it says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. I don't know if you've ever felt like the world is squeezing you into its mold. You know, where you say, I, I just get pressure from all sides. My mom used to have these little jello molds, you know, when I was growing up. And we would just pour this liquid in there and just squeeze it. And I, I, one of the things I used to like is it's just to take jello and just like squeeze it, you know, and it'd like come all out in your hands and everything else. We need our minds renewed, folks. This is what's in there. And so. <laughs> It, whatever you do, it would take on the shape of the mold, right? Conforming to it. And so whatever pattern you pick, that's what you're going to be conformed to. If the world is what you want, you're going to conform to the world. If the Lord is what you want, he's going to transform your life so that you look like him. See, Paul's here saying, don't be a jello person. Don't be a person who just lets people do whatever they want to do to your life and tell you what your life is supposed to be about. 
Have a little bit more of a spine than that. Don't let the world press you and shape you and all the rest of this. See, I know I was young once. It was a long time ago. But young people in general, I, I think there's peer pressure all the way throughout our life. But there's especially that time when it's so strong, you know. And a lot of young people, myself included, I remember wanted to rebel. I'm going to rebel. I'm going to just rebel against any authority I can find. And so they re rebel against their parents. They rebel against the Lord, all those sorts of things. But I, I come back to it. That's not real rebellion. It really isn't. That is exact conformity to what the world is doing, rebelling against authority and rebelling against God. See, you think about it this way. If you really want to be a rebel, if you really want to be a rebel, Rebel against the world. Rebel against sin. Rebel against the devil. See, any dead fish can go with the flow. Just you, can, you don't need life in you. But it takes a live fish to swim up the stream. And guess what? The stream of this world is not headed in the right direction. And so many people think, again, that they're rebelling and they're such rebels. And you go, you're just conforming. You're conforming to the devil's plan for your life. It's kind of like the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. You know, there's one of those things in life that we just see it on the wall there and we see it in our house and everything else. A thermometer just reflects whatever's going on in the room. It was kind of a funny thing that happened to me the other day at the West Campus, which is you're supposed to have a, a clock there that tells you what time it is. But whoever set it up, they set it up so all it told me was the temperature. <laughs> so I'm, I'm teaching along and I look over and I'm like, 72 degrees. Am I getting warmer? Am I getting hotter? Is it, you know, is it, what's it going to happen? If it starts going 82, it's time to stop. And I was like, I don't even have any idea what time it is. So I think I went about five minutes over there, or at least two or three degrees over. I'm not sure which one it was. But a thermostat, what it does, it actually changes the temperature of the room. See, all the, a thermometer does is tell you what's up or what's down. But a thermostat is different. A thermostat actually affects the temperature of the room. It changes it. So if you set it to some standard, it's actually going to transform the temperature. And so as you think about those two, it's just another analogy to think about. But we have a choice. Do I want to be a thermometer? Whatever the world does, I just reflect it. Or what the world's doing, I want to affect it. I want to affect it in the right direction. That's what it is to be renewed. That's what it is to be renovated in your mind. That's what it is to have your life changing. Out with the old, in with the new. You know, under new management. We went by a restaurant the other day, and we saw under new management, and we said, well, it's worth a try. I bet they would clean it up at least when they first came in. You know, so we decided to do that. But it says there in verse 2 that the result would be something really cool. It says that you will prove God's will. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you go, what is God's will for my life? I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with my life. See, and sometimes people have it like that it's this big cosmic Easter egg that you're supposed to hunt for and God's always moving it. But what you see instead is that the result of a renewed mind, the result of a life laid down as a living sacrifice where you just say, God, you got me, whatever, you're going to prove God's will. It's just going to happen in your life. It's one of these things that people look at and go, why does God's will just work for you? Well, uh, it's because he's doing what he wants to do with my life because I'm not rebelling against his work in my life. Just proving it. It gives you clear thinking. It gives you clear direction in life. And see, one of the biggest questions, again, that people have is, what is God's will for me? But this gives us the answer to that right there, how to find it. The will of God is in the word of God, and it takes a renewed mind to know God's word, first of all, but actually to do it. See, what I've found over the years in my own life often is the case, but also in many others, maybe in you, is that the will of God is not a question of knowing what to do, although sometimes it is. It's doing what I know. I mean, I already know what to do. It's just that, that power, that will, that desire to actually do what he's told me to do. See, and I'm fully convinced that if I obey the very general will of God, which is very specific here, in saying, lay your life down, alter, stay on that altar. Let me do what I want to do in your life. See, the more uncertain things, they just kind of take care of themselves along the way. If you think about it, your transformed life, what it has the power to do is to prove God's will is good and perfect 
and acceptable. Those are the words it uses there. Isn't that cool? Because, see, so many people think, oh, man, if I were to surrender to God, do you know what he would do to me? He'd rip my arm off or something like that. And you go, well, no, remember, he's not like some sadistic kid from, a, you know, the Toy Story or something. Sid, I think, was his name. But God's plan for you is so much better than your plan for you. You know, that's, that's a great realization for me to come to. And the world says, man, God will mess you up. But I know God's word says, renewing my mind, it says that I know the plans I have for you, a plans for a future and a hope, not to harm you, but to bless you. And so seeing some specifics here tonight, this is what I want to do is look at some of the things in this chapter We'll just kind of take a sample of them to see what a renewed life and mind would look like, what the result of these things would look like. So verse 3, look at it with me. It says, For I say through the grace given to me that everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. Now this is the first kind of major takeaway from today as we're thinking about the application of these truths, which is, God wants to transform how we think about ourselves, how we think about ourselves. And again, remember, there's two columns, two choices there, conformed or transformed. A, a clear contrast here that you can answer for yourself, am I letting God renew my mind? If I'm conformed to the world, I have pride. That's what you're going to see the world have. It says here, thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But he says a sober judgment, that's a word for humble. That's a word for accurate, you know, honest. Transformed by the word, you will have a humble view of yourself. Now, again, whenever I think of these things, I see so much misunderstanding in it. What often passes for humility is something like this. I stink. I'm ugly. I can't do anything. Notice that person has an eye problem. I, 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 I. See, it's really just the other side of pride. You know, people say, oh, I have so much, such humility. I'm always thinking about all my shortcomings. But remember, that's just a person focused on themselves, the other side of pride. But the two choices there, conformed or transformed, it's such a great question to look at. A sober judgment. See, humility is not just thinking bad things about yourself. It's just not thinking so much about yourself. That's what humility really is. It's just an accurate assessment where you go, you know, there's a lot of people on the planet and uh, we all matter, but I don't matter more than anybody or any less than anybody. See, you think about these things, a sober judgment. What is sober? Well, just think of the opposite and you'll know what sober is. Think about drunk. When people are drunk, they think they are way smarter than they really are. <laughs> they do. They think they are way better looking than they really are. You know? Hey, looking pretty good. <laughs> yeah. They think they can drive better and, you know, everything else better than they really can. It's an inaccurate view of self. And again, it talks about it here sober, but it talks about pride because, you know what, pride is more intoxicating than liquor. So you think about it this way, renewing your mind, sober judgment, it's an accurate assessment of your strengths, of your weaknesses, of your abilities with and without God, all the rest of that. Conform to the world, you know, it's all about self-esteem. If you watch shows, if you listen to things, what the message that gets pumped at our kids is, you got to believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, there's nothing you can't do. You know, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Just tell yourself that, you know. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all and all those things. But whenever somebody is so self-obsessed, you realize, listen, a self-made person, when people say that I'm a self-made man, you know, I always ask, what part did you make? You know, did you make your brain? Did you make your eyes? You made your face? You made your hands? You made your feet? You made all the things that help you make money, all those things? Well, see, continuing in verse 4, what we see is a transformed life is not just thinking differently about self, but it's how we think about others, too. That's a thing that God wants to transform in our lives. Verse 4, it says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Again, that's the second takeaway here today, which is transform how you think about others. That's what God wants to do. First of all, 
Transform the way you think about yourself. You know, to see that God value, values you and that's where your value comes from. But second of all, to see others as valuable. The body of Christ, the faith family, the church. This is what it's talking about. It says one body made up of many parts. You know, again, this idea of the toy here. But one of the most exciting things about Transformers, I think, and certainly it was what the kids were always after us for it every Christmas and birthday, you know, and what I'll probably be asking for for my birthday is other toys that actually interconnect with these. You know, if you go get the Happy Meal toys or the Burger King toys or whatever, you know what you get? Interlocking stuff. And that just makes it all the more fun. See, as long as you get them all, that's what the marketers want you to do. That's where you get all the fun. But in the same way, what it's saying is, hey, we are divinely designed to be transformers, but not lone rangers. See, we're not just to reach our potential in ourselves. You know, I think differently of myself, either humility or pride or whatever. No, to come to realize part of humility, part of a sober judgment is to realize, well, I may be some things, but I'm not everything, and I need other things people in my life. See, the Bible repeatedly uses the interrelatedness, the interconnection of the church body as a point to make that we all have a body. You know, I'm sure everybody here has a body, right? I can know that about all of you. You may like yours, you may not. You want to change with somebody else, all the rest. You want to interchange some parts. You know, science lets us do that now sometimes. But, you know, when you think about it, Conform to the world, what is it? Again, it's that independence. It's that self-centered, fiercely independent society. You know, it's part of the American uh, thing sometimes. And I suppose there's a good part to it. But really, there can be that, hey, I don't need anybody else. You know, that kind of, uh, again, Clint Eastwood sort of thing where it's just like me against the world type of thing. But, you know, a life that's conformed to the world believes that my abilities are not just from me, for me, you know, a life conformed to the world, that's what it thinks. My abilities, they're from me, I got them, I built them, and they are for me. Whatever I can do with them, whatever I can do for myself, that's fine. If I have talents or abilities, they're for my good, they're for my glory. But a life transformed by the word realizes that our gifts are from God and for God. And see, the thing is, again, God doesn't need our gifts. This is something for us to remember. I like to remember it all the time. God doesn't need anything from me. He's not up there saying, man, I really could use somebody with, you know, administrative ability because, you know, I really need that. You know, I, I'm real confused. I made the world in six days and got to rest on the seventh, but I need your help, Scott. No, he doesn't need my help. He gives us gifts for our benefit. Yes, we get blessed by it, but others as well. See, anything and everything I have is for God's purposes. And one of the things God is, is other-centered. See, I love it because not everyone has the same gift. Everyone's unique, and sometimes we fight against that. That's what's so funny is our world wants to conform people down. It can't stand people that are different, and yet God made us all different. See, not everybody has, for example, the gift of singing like I do. See, I went to, uh, <laughs> I went to Nate, you know, Nathaniel here, the worship leader, and I, I told him, listen, I, you know, I'm tired of just playing the drums. I want to sing. You know, I want to sing. And he said, okay, you can sing. You can sing solo. Solo, nobody can hear you. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm kidding, Scott. You can sing tenor, 10 or 12 miles away. <laughs> now, conform to the world. See, conform to the world is competition, right? If somebody has a gift, you don't. You, or you have a gift, the same gift, you compete. You say, who, who's better? Who's faster? Who's smarter? All this stuff. Envy. There's a lot of critics, too. You know, people who sit on the sidelines and criticize people who have great gifts. You know, find fault with them. But to be transformed by the word is to see a cooperation, an encouragement, a participation where you say, you know what? My gift will never reach its potential without the gifts of other people. And their gift will never reach its potential without the gifts God has given me. That's the interconnectedness there. And in the body relationship, hopefully, what God intended is that we would not compete with one another, we cooperate. See, what if my body were to compete with itself, you know? Where my left sit leg says, then, you know, I'm left-handed, but I'm also, I guess, left-legged, if you can be such a thing. You know, it's a little bit stronger. But... What if it said, hey, I'm a lot faster than you to my right leg? And my right leg gets real hurt by that and says, fine, I'm just going home. You know, it's like, ugh. What? Neither one of them is going to get to do what they were supposed to do. 
Now, it says there in verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. And he goes on to give a little list here of some of the uh, gifts. And, he, you know, you can see them there. Now, as a parent, what I do is I really enjoy giving gifts to our kids. I mean, my wife and I both do. You know, I, I think sometimes people think God is like this miserly parent who doesn't want to do anything for us, who doesn't want to give us anything. No, I, I think God is very clearly in the Bible a very generous, almost sometimes I feel like he spoils some of our lives. But, you know, you look at it and you see these things. I love to see my kids play with gifts that I've given them. But I also love even more to see that they're not spoiled by the gift that I gave them and they would actually share that with somebody else. See, that's one of the things I have to learn as I mature, where the kids are going, Dad, let me play with my toy. No, 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 no. Dad's still figuring it out. You know, I don't want anyone to get hurt. You know, I got to make sure that it's all safe and stuff. But sharing, right? It's part of growing up. And God, our Father, is exactly the same way. He doesn't mind giving us great gifts, but he loves to see us, most of all, not spoiled by that gift, but sharing that gift for the benefits of others. So he says just right there, it's not an exhaustive list here. There's many in Scripture. But he says, let us use them. Let us use them. Now, I, again, a second probably only to what's God's will for my life. The other question we get here all the time is, what are my gifts? I don't have any gifts. You know, I'm the one who was standing behind the door when the Lord was handing out gifts, you know. <laughs> I say, no, that's not true. The best way to find out what your gifts are is to start serving somewhere. You'll almost immediately find out whether you're gifted there or not. You know, again, if you, if you just say... I, here I am, I show up, you know what, and, and if, if you're great and gifted in that, you'll find out. You'll find out quickly. People will tell you about it. And if you don't get hurt, you know, and be so sensitive that if, if you find out, no, not, that wasn't it. Okay, I can mark one off the list. That was not it. But that's, you know, narrowing in on the truth, and you'll find out. One of the ways I like to do it is just ask myself or ask somebody, what would you change if you were in charge? Oh, man, I'd change a lot of things if I was in charge. You know, this place is so disorganized. Oh, my gosh, it's so disorganized. And you go, well, maybe you have the gift, as the Bible talks about, the gift of administration, the gift of organization, the gift of cleanliness. You know, that's a great thing. Sometimes people will say, you know what this church ought to be doing for more for people in hospitals and prisons and things like that? You're right. It should. Maybe you have the gift of mercy. Maybe that's you seeing what needs to change. So what would you change if you're in charge? That's going to hone in a lot of times your gifts. Now the problem is we tend to evaluate a lot of times, I think, people on the basis of our gifts. And it takes one of two flavors. One is, why aren't they more like I am? You know, you look at somebody who has the gift of uh, you know, discernment and they look at things and go, that person's messed up. You know, and they've, they've got that ability. <laughs> But then there's somebody who's got the gift of mercy and they go, I know they're messed up, but I, you know, da, da, da. And they're like, why don't you more discerning? And they look at, why aren't you more merciful? Well, maybe there's different gifts in those that a discerning person has to look and say, you know what? We're not going to put a really messed up person into a position of prominence, but that doesn't mean we're going to hustle them out the door. Maybe they need to have some mercy in their life. And so we tend to evaluate others, you know, why aren't they more like I am? Or this one is a huge one. Why aren't I more like they are? So you see somebody with a gift you didn't get or a gift you wish you got. You say, man, why aren't I more like they are? I wish there were none of me and two of them, you know, and that sort of thing. But see, the conformed mentality, that is the world's way of thinking big time. That is hugely the world. See, if they aren't like I am, I don't like them. Or if I'm not like they are, I don't like me. But see, a transformed thought is, you know what? God made us intentionally distinct, inten intentionally unique. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to, in order that we might, change our thinking on how we treat each other. See, I think about this. It was great. Uh, one of our kids was talking about reading a magazine and just shared this with me the other day. And I said, wow, that's an awesome illustration. He was talking about cycling teams, you know, bicycling teams. And there's two different types, at least, of cyclists, which is sprinters and drafters. I'm neither of those. When I go out and ride a bike, I don't even know what I'm doing. I guess I'm a faller or something. But, 
a, you know, a, a mosier or whatever the word would be. But Lance Armstrong, you probably recognize his name. He's a very well-known name. Well, he's really both, but he is well-known as a sprinter. I mean, this guy is just a master sprinter. But there are also other people on his team, people who, unless you're really into cycling, you probably don't recognize their names. But they are drafters, see, and they tend to be built different physically. These are, some of these things you can change or modify. Some of these things are just, you got what you got when God gave you what you got. See, there's something called fast twitch muscle groups, and you go, well, I sometimes twitch. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a certain build of your muscles. And no matter how much you try to have those, if you don't have them, if you weren't given them, you're not going to have them. And so different body styles, different things, and even as you age, you're less able to do the sprinting part. Well, what's a drafter? Well, a drafter forms a barrier around the sprinter. They actually form this, like, formation, and the sprinter stays back behind the drafters. Why? The drafters are taking the brunt of the wind. They're the ones with some of the really strong just persevering muscles. And at the last part of the race, they split, and that sprinter goes right up the middle. And they try, at that point, to keep the sprinter as fresh as possible all throughout the race. Now, again, people could complain all day long about which one they are, and you didn't give me enough twitch or something like that, but wait, I want to switch. But this is the point. They will not win without each other. They won't win without each other. Lance Armstrong won't win without the drafters. And neither will we. See, in our life, you may say, I want to be the sprinter. I want to be the known name. I want to be this person. You know what? God arranges in the body just as he, as he wills, but nobody's going to win. The visible or less visible. See, the, the thing it talks about here in verse 9, I love this, because this is where the rest of the chapter, as we look at it, it's going to say we need to just change our whole way of thinking about life. See, I could go down through a long list and we're, we'll hit some of them, but the bottom line is when I think about my life, I was wrong on pretty much everything. Why? Because I was conformed to the world and I think for just about everything I thought, the word said something the opposite of what I thought. You know, just, oh, well, that's not what I thought. Well, how's your way working for you, Scott? Well, not so well. Okay, well, you want to try my way? Yeah, let's do that. So this is what you see. He says, let love be, verse 9, without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So again, this is the third takeaway, which is we need to transform how we think of life, how we think about life. See, the next section here, a bunch of contrasts, a bunch of things where he says, here's the stinking thinking of the world, and here's what God wants to do in our life. God wants to transform our attitudes and actions about just about anything you can imagine. If you think of a topic and you say, okay, what's the world think about that? <laughs> All right, what does God think about that? It's rarely going to be in the same column. And so you see verse 9 here, love. The world loves to think about love, loves to talk about love. Just got a weird definition compared to God's definition of love. See, the word love's all over the Bible, but it's really not talking about the same thing. See, God's word is not a kind of love you. You know that thing where people love you, kiss, kiss, you know, and, they, and then hypocrisy, man. They just love you, but hate you, They're, you know, going to blog about you, all that kind of stuff. And you what? <laughs> what happened to love you, kiss, kiss, you know, all that. Now, see, a transformed mind understands that true love that God has, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't love and then hate and then love, and then hate, and you know, have hypocrisy, and sin, and flip-flops, and all the rest of that. And the thing is, it will hate. Real love will hate sin, especially in ourselves. See, it's really easy to hate sin in someone else and kind of love it in me, you know. But, but God says, you know what, you almost kind of have to change those around to where the sin you hate the most is the sin in you. See, the word there is abhor. I love that word, abhor, you know. Sounds like a pirate word. Abhor, abhor. Our son, Stephen, he abhors vegetables. That's the best thing I can think of. That. You know, he can't even eat a sandwich that has been around a vegetable. If there's been like a tomato on it once, you know, if you or forget to order it without the tomato, it's like it has essence of tomato on it. No matter what, you know, he's like, I can still smell it. I'm like... I can still smell it. You know, rub it with the napkin and stuff. And that's the thing. To abhor, is that how you see evil in your own life? You know, conformed or transformed, this is going to have a lot to do with it, which is what we think of our own sin. See, if we kind of don't abhor it, man, we kind of coddle it, kind of like it. It's our little pet sin. 
<laughs> it's kind of cute, isn't it? Cute on me, ugly on you. But, you know, I'm going to like it. But, man, when I abhor it, when I say I hate my sin, I hate for my sin for what it's done to me. I hate it for what it did to my Lord. I hate it for what it does to my family. I just abhor it. I can't even stand the smell of it. See, that's when transformation happens. And so he says in verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Now, we have uh, a boy and two girls, and, and when I think of brotherly love in the Bible, I kind of go, I bet our girls read that and go, what in the world would that even be, you know? <laughs> you know, giving them kind of thing or something. But it says, in honor, giving preference to one another. See, I, it talks about affection there. And think about it. Our society is a sexual society, but not an affectionate one. I mean, affection is pretty much out of it in our society. But man, we've got the world saying, you know, just pulsing with this sexual thing. But it's sad because, you know, the times that marriages really fall apart is when affection is gone. See, when affection is gone, pretty soon sex is gone too. You can have one without the other, but not for long. And so you see in here our daughter's I teach them these things, too. My son, I teach him these things, too. Our family, our kids, we want to be affectionate with them. We want to teach them, you know. In this sexual society, there's such a difference between those things. Giving preference to one another, letting somebody else go first. He says they're lagging in diligence. Now, is that what we should be, verse 11? Well, the world says we should. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the old... Every year during the sports playoffs, they always have these little things that come out on the computer where you can fool your boss, you know, where you do the alt-tab thing and a spreadsheet comes up and then you alt-tab back and it's a fake little thing so you can watch the game and the boss comes in, you're watching that. But the problem is, see, the boss is doing that too. So they're wise to you. <laughs> you know, they're like, I have that same spreadsheet in my office, you know. So you see, lagging in diligence, he's saying, you know, don't be that way. Be fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Conform to the world is to do as little as possible, as little as necessary. I'm amazed these days. Wow, apathy is really cool. Apathy is just a cool way to be. You know, nothing's exciting. You know, somebody will win something or something, or how do you feel about it? It's all right, you know. A, a rock star will win some award for the 50th time, and they're like, it's cool. You know, I'm kind of got angst or whatever, bored with life. But transformed is to be passionate about life, man, to feel a full speed ahead kind of thing when it comes to the Lord. You know, I love it because in our family, there's sometimes a lot of excitement about everything except serving, <laughs> you know. When it comes to the kids, they'll like play all day long and you say, could somebody go empty the trash? And it's like, oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> Can't keep the eyes open. I just need a nap. I think I'm sick. <laughs> See? The way of the world is don't be a fanatic about God. You know, you ever heard that? It's cool to go to church, man, but don't get all fanatical on me. Don't get all passionate about the things of the Spirit. But the fervent servant there, that's what it's talking about. When I think about this, I think about James here and the James gang, as I would put it, and my father-in-law is part of the James gang. What the James gang is is the uh, group that actually uh, has the gift of cleaning this place up. And this place smells and looks fresh because of the James gang, you know, because they use their gift. Now, I don't know about how your house smells, but, you know, this house has hundreds of kids come into it and hundreds of big kids like you guys come in here every single week. So, you know, it, it's pretty rough to keep it that way. But when James is on vacation, you don't need to ask. You don't need to say, like, hey, where's James? Why? Because all you got to do is come in the door and go, oh, James not here? No, James isn't here. Because he has that orange spray. I don't know if you guys have seen it on Sunday. <laughs> Don't get caught in that stuff, you know. Sometimes I, I walk along, oh, man, I walked into the cloud. <laughs> but James is one of those guys with just an energy, you know, uh, naturally to himself. But one of the things he does every once in a while is he gets an energy drink in him. Now, that's a scary thing if you've ever seen it. But I, that, uh, there's one that they have out over here. Sometimes he'll sw stop by the uh, Coca-Cola plant over there, and they get full throttle, they, they call it. And it's in a big bottle, a big bottle of full throttle. Jet fuel is what it's uh, really there. And you can see James, uh, the fervent servant, because he's like wiping the windows like this, you know, <laughs> and mopping the floor. And wow, you know, he's like done at 930. And you go, wow, James, uh, you heading off early? Yeah, Whew. the place is all done. Nothing left to do, you know. But the fervent servant, man, to do that with the energy, to do whatever you do, the Bible says, with the energy 
that God provides because you're doing it for Him. See, lukewarm love won't keep me faithful in my, in my marriage, you know? If I'm not fervent about that love, it's not going to be protected. It's not going to last. If you see, this, a lukewarm love really isn't going to keep us out from the world's thing. If we have a lukewarm lo- love for the Lord, it's not going to give us the passion that it is to kill the passions that the world is trying to entice us with. You see in verse 12, he says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Again, just kind of a laundry list here, but the conformed life, what is it? It's complaining life. It's a murmuring life. It's a hopeless life. It's an angry, angst-filled life. You know, it's pretty much what Miami is known for. I had a, an, an idea here to make my million dollars. You know, I'm always coming, ever since I was a kid, I'd always come up with uh, inventions and then find out someone had already invented them a long time ago. But maybe somebody's already invented this, or maybe you will now that you hear it. But when I came to Miami for the first time, you know intermittent wipers, how you uh, set them on a setting and every few seconds they go and you don't have to keep doing it? I think I want to market an intermittent horn. That as you're going through different areas of town, you go, well, okay, this is an every three seconds area where you just set it and forget it, you know, and you just, eh, eh, you know, and you don't have to think about it. Hialeah, put it on high, you know, <laughs> woo, yeah, coming through Hialeah, constant, you know, ng, 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 ng. I think it's a great idea, frankly. You heard it here first. Now, it says there in verse 13 that we need to be distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. And I love this. Again, conform to the world, what is it? More for me. You know, I'm the owner of my stuff. Transformed by the word, it's a coming to realize that God's the owner. I'm just the manager. Whatever God wants to flow into my life, well, certainly he'll flow things into my life for my blessing because he's not stingy. But see, God will flow resources most through the lives of those who are really committed to being channels not reservoirs see a reservoir says more for me a channel says well you know that's enough for me and let's see what i can do for others he talks there about giving to hospitality that literally means hunting for hunting for people now i'm not talking about hunting with a rifle you know i'm talking about what it's saying there's going out of your way for one you know like jesus did that's what jesus was all about i mean if you want to see what kind of thinking he had what kind of action he had He wasn't just always hanging with his posse. In fact, he often ditched the disciples so that he could minister to somebody because he knew that they were mainly just sitting there arguing about who the greatest was. And he's like, I'll leave you guys to that one again. I'm going to go minister to somebody who actually needs it and will actually receive from it. And so we tend to head first toward those who are familiar. And that's, that's natural. That's normal. But something supernatural is when a person actually comes into a situation hunting for hospitality, saying, how can I be a help to somebody maybe who doesn't have themselves surrounded by a trillion friends? See, again, we come to church and, and, and so many, we want to fellowship with the familiar. And there's nothing wrong with saying hi to your friends. That's a great thing. But to be on the lookout, this is one of the maturing things, to be transformed. The world doesn't do it mostly, but the transforming power of the word can say, you know what, tonight's a night to actually care for someone who maybe nobody else does. And I wonder how this church would be transformed if even a few, if if maybe a few more people would come to this place thinking, what can I do for others while I'm here? What needs can I meet? Who can I make feel welcome? Who can I encourage? You know, hospitable. The, The word there, it's real close to hospital. You know, because people around you are hurting and you say, well, I'm hurting too. But you know what? One of the most of... Amazing things is when you get around somebody who's hurting, suddenly you stop thinking so much about how you're hurting. It's amazing how often I've seen something, you know, where I'm hurt and one of the kids get hurt and suddenly I don't even, th- I'm not even thinking about that anymore. As soon as we got them all taken care of, I go, man, my, my back still hurts, you know, but I wasn't even thinking about it while I was with that other person. And so verse 14, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Sometimes it's easier to weep with those who weep than rejoice with those who rejoice. You know, someone comes in, I got a new car and a new job. And you're like, great. (laughs) Hallelujah. Anything go bad so I can weep with you? You know. (laughs) But he says, 
Be of the same mind toward one another, verse 16. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. See, again, that renewed mind, just uh, as we're coming to the close of these thoughts, be, be the same mind toward each other. What it's saying is, you know, think from the other person's perspective. Seek common ground with each other, you know. Associate with the humble. What is that saying? Well, what's the world's way? The world's way is to idolize a certain segment of our society. The rich and the famous, wow, I want to associate with them. Poor and obscure, eh, I'm already one of them. I don't want to be around them. See, the, the transformed mind is that everyone's a VIP. See, one of the goals that we have here as a church, we've been able, to, in, in many ways, over the history of the church, to minister to some sort of high-profile people. But what you think about that is what we try to do is treat them like they're normal people, and then we try to treat normal people like they're VIPs. Just kind of treating everybody, hopefully, like the Word says to, that everybody matters enough for Jesus to die for them. And if he thought they were worth dying for, then certainly we can treat them with some honor. Even the greatest of men is just a man. That doesn't mean we don't honor them, but hey, at the end of the day, they're just people like we are. And then you see, hey, the least of people, again, made in the image of God, that gives them a value when we think like God does. Now, verse 17, he says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, if you ask me, this is kind of one of the toughest transformations. It's where we'll end tonight thinking on this, this general subject, which is what do you do with the jerks of life? <laughs> you know, what do you do with the people who haven't been or aren't being transformed by the word of God? You know, where you say, well, I'm being transformed. It's that one that isn't, you know. And the world says, hey, to be conformed, what is it? Look, if somebody wrongs you, you have every right to wrong them back. One-upmanship even. You know, if they wrong you once, you wrong them twice. You don't get mad, you get even, you know. Think of something even worse. But it says here, live at peace with all as much as it's possible with you, which means, obviously, it's not always possible. But there's a great little principle that I try to live my life by, which is I'm responsible for my actions, not other people's reactions. You know, I can't do anything about how people react, but I can do everything about how I act. And so if I can't get along with other believers, this is the question, how am I ever going to transform the world or see the world transformed through my life? If they look on at the church and go, well, man, they're no different than we are. They're conformed just like we are. This is one of the reasons I, I love the thoughts of this, which is that as long as this thing looks like a truck, nothing changes. But boy, when this thing stands out as a robot, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. That transformation actually, it brings attention to it. See, verse 19, it says, Beloved, don't avenge yourself. That one's a tough one. Rather give place to wrath, for it's written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, say, says the Lord. And you go, well, could you do it now? He, <laughs> said, no. he says, no, while you wait, here's what I want you to do. Verse 20, therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. Okay, like what should I put in it? <laughs> if he's thirsty, give him a drink. Oh, yeah, I got something I can put in it. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. You say, That's, that part sounds fun. No. This is what he's saying. You're going to transform that person through your transformed life. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, the best way to get rid of an enemy is to turn him into a friend. You say, well, man, I have tried. Well, again, the, the world says conform to it, kill him. <laughs> just kill him. Either kill him physically or just kill him emotionally. Just say, just get away from him, have nothing to do with him. And uh, kill them with your words and kill them with your actions, you know. But transform by the word, what does it say? Kill them with kindness. Man, just heap it on them till they just can't take it anymore. They go, I can't stand these Christians. They're so nice to me. <laughs> See, and here's the thing. This is the important thing. Even if they never change, you will. And that's what God wanted anyway. See, transforming others, well, that's God's work. 
transforming myself? Well, I have to co cooperate with God. That's my deal with him. And so transform. First of all, we saw it, how we think about ourselves. A sober judgment. Not thinking lower of ourselves than we should because God has lifted us. But not thinking higher than ourselves because we can't be puffed up in pride. Just an accurate assessment. Now you see transforming how we think of others. You know, putting them first. Understanding we need them, you know. And then transforming how we think of life all over the place. See, God isn't just interested in transforming us, although he is. He's wanting to transform the world through us. This is what's so cool. See, we can have a changed life that changed lives. See, as my life changes, as your life changes, other lives change through them. Maybe some of you even in this room can think of a life that was changed that changed yours, where you said, I want some of what they have. I want more of that. See, again, can you imagine the transformation in this town if we were more transformers than conformers? See, a lot of times everyone thinks, I know how I'll change the world. I'll get just like them, and then I'll be really relevant, and they'll want to change. And you go, well, see, the problem with that is they'll look on and go, well, why should I be like you? The only thing that means is I have something to do on Sunday every week, you know? No, I'd rather just be me. But see... The problem is a lot of people stop with information, but remember that. It's not information, it's transformation. That's what God wants to do in our lives. Our changed lives would and will change lives. And we would not just be overcome by evil like so many, you know, oh man, the evil of the world, it overcomes me, it overwhelms me. No, what God's word says right here is we would overcome evil with good. Now, is that really possible? You know, is that just movie magic? Could that really happen? Can a life transform? Well, again, only by the mercies of God. And you're looking right now at a person who has been transformed. If you don't believe me, ask my wife sometime. I wasn't born Pastor Scott, and I wasn't always the way that I am. Does that mean I'm perfect? Yes, that's exactly what it means. No, <laughs> no. But I'm not the same as I was. She knows that. And God knows it. And at the cross, God overcame the greatest evil ever with the greatest good ever. This is the thought I want to leave in our minds here. The greatest evil ever, what was it? Well, it was the torture and crucifixion, the sacrifice of the only innocent man that ever lived. There, you know, there's been a lot of guys who have proclaimed they're innocent. I'm innocent, judge. I, you know, I didn't do it. Listen, nobody's innocent. There's only one who's ever been innocent. And so there at the cross, that's man at his worst. But you see God at his best. You see Jesus saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He overcame evil with good. His great good overcomes my great evil. And so again, as I think about this little transformer, you know, this little toy right here, it can't transform itself. It can't. No matter what you do with it, it's not going to do that. That's all graphic work, you know. And I brought the simplest one I could find. Why? Because, uh, you know, I'm too old to figure out the, the more complex ones. You know, it takes a five-year-old to actually do those. Because it's the hand of an expert that can really transform. And so in the same way, I just want to share with you as we close, man, none of us can transform ourselves. None of us can. It's going to take Jesus living in us and through us in a real and radical way. And to have a renewed life, you have to have a renewed heart and renewed mind. How do you get that? Well, the Bible says that if, any, if anyone's in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And so the big question as we close out for everyone in this room is, are you in Christ? I know you're in church, but see, the thing is, you can come to church and get information. But coming to church does not automatically give you transformation. And so to go beyond information and on to transformation, that's a work of God's Spirit. That is when you give yourself over to Him, when you say, God, I'm yours. I want what you have for me. And see, my wife knows one of the things that I used to do is gather information. Oh, man, when we were first married, I read every book. <laughs> There's got to be something here. You know, I'd go to the library and just devour self-help books. And I'd get tips and I'd get techniques and I'd get principles and all these things. And guess what? My marriage was still messed up. My life was still messed up. There was one book I never seemed to look in. But when I looked in that book and I saw the transforming power of God, that's when all that self-help, forget that, man. I need God's help. And so if you're here tonight, 
And that's your realization. You can't help yourself. God doesn't help those who help themselves. He helps those who cannot help themselves, who admit that. And so we're going to close out with a prayer. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads. And if there's anyone here today who realizes, hey, I need what you talked about today. I need the transforming power of God in my life. Well, I'm just going to ask you wherever you're sitting, right there in your seat, just raise your hand up high and I'll lead you in a prayer committing your life to Christ. Anybody here tonight saying, I need God's work in my life. I want to commit myself to him. I want to know that I'm in Christ. I want to know that I'm forgiven. If that's you, wherever you're sitting, just raise up your hand. I'll lead you in a prayer. For those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. It's a, a prayer of commitment. God will hear you. The Bible says that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, we will be saved. We will be transformed. We will be made new. And so repeat this prayer with me. God, I thank you for sending your son for my sin. I believe that Jesus died and rose again to give me that transformed life. I have the information. But Lord, I need the transformation. And I pray that you would come into my life, my heart, my mind, and do a work from the inside out. From this day forward, I want to follow you. Be my God, my Savior, and my friend. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.